Are we ready? Okay, calling the meeting to order on this first day of summer. Hey. Hey. Some opening remarks to get us going. Uh, this meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department, RMLD Board of Commissioners, being videotaped at the RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street, Reading Mass, for distribution to the community television stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes that the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as items as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties including members of the RMLD board act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It's the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. All right. So introductions. We have representing the Citizen Advisory Board, the esteemed Neil Cohen. Welcome. <laughs> Neil. Thank you. Good to be here. And our secretary for tonight is uh, Tom O'Rourke. Would you? I'd be honored do, to. Uh, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We also see uh, one of our select board members, Vanessa mm -hmm. Alvarado, here as well. well. Welcome her. All right. Public comment. Well, why don't we go to the Citizens Advisory Board first? I mentioned Neil. Neil, do you have any comments? I have no comments to make. No, no comments, That's okay. And um, any liaisons to the RMLG Board? I don't see here. Any Vanessa. public comments? What's Vanessa. that? Vanessa. Oh, Vanessa. Vanessa. She's a liaison to the Yeah. <laughs> Vanessa, do you have anything you want to share? Yeah. All mm -hmm. right. And I don't see any other public uh, comments here, so we could go on. To the approval. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. I want to acknowledge Dave's uh, remote. Oh, yes. I also want to acknowledge that Dave Talbot is on a conference call. He's so we got a full full participation of the RMLD board. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I didn't uh, be there. I saw the family uh, in the distance. No. Oh, I hope everything's okay. Sure. Okay. Hey, Dave. Hi, Dave. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Dave. Okay, approval of the minutes. Um, we want to make a motion to I'll, I'll move take that, that one. Uh, I'm going to move both of them unless somebody has an objection. I'll move that we approve the meeting minutes of April 5th, 2018 and April 17th, 2018 on the recommendation of the general manager and as presented. Okay, second. second. All right, second. Discussion? And now I think we have to do a roll call vote because right, Dave. Dave on the phone. Okay, so. Tom O'Rourke, aye. Mr. Pacino, aye. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Mr. Stempak, aye. Mr. Talbot, aye. All right. All right. And now we move to the report of the chairman. What do I have to report? No, no. You, you skipped me. You what skipped me. Okay, what do you got? <laughs> you skipped me. What do you have? <laughs> Number six. <laughs> Number six. Number six. <laughs> Number <Report>. six. <laughs> Don't Pacino report on the May 16th and June 20th meeting. Yes. Okay. Yep. You already did that, though. Mm. How soon we forget? Oh, you want to report on it as well, <laughs> as, well as approve the minutes. You also want to report on it. We okay. Yes. All right. Uh, yes. Please okay. report. So I attended both the uh, May 16th meeting of, uh, of the Citizen Advisory Board, at which, uh, you know, it was really very general stuff. They talked about the financial report. Uh, there was an update on the uh, reliability study and the organizational study. And they also talked about who was attending the uh, NEPA conference. Uh, on June the 13th, I attended the Town of Reading Audit Committee meeting, at which point we had a presentation from the Town of Reading Auditors, uh, the uh, Melanson Heath, uh, and basically the uh, the Town of Reading Audit Committee did uh, recommend did did recommend the audit be accepted as presented. And uh, I might add, there was no uh, management letter or, or anything that the uh, the auditors brought up that was a problem on the Town of Reading side. So. Great. That. That's good and news. Then on the June 20th, I attended the Citizen Advisory Board. I was uh, Mr. Stenpeck stand in. All right, I was. I'm sorry about that. I had a business conflict. It's okay. That's okay. You're forgiven. <laughs> um, Let's leave that to the chair to decide. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, make it up. I'll make it up to you. Uh, basically, they, they, and this was last night, uh, they basically approved the minutes. They talked about the OSHA requirements. Uh, the OSHA vehicle pilot program was discussed, which is, we're getting a presentation tonight mm -hmm. also. And they also demonstrated, Joyce did a great job of re uh, designing the, uh, the redesign of the RMLD's website. 
So. Great. Nice job, Joyce. Yes. <laughs> it looks great. All right. Okay. And Phil, you've been very busy. Impressive. Yes. yes. Great Thank contributions. You. Thank you. All right. Then it says report of the chairman. And I don't have a report. So I'm going to go to number eight, I think. And that's the general manager's report. Pauline? Yes, thank you. And good evening to everyone. Um, as you all know, we have taken uh, the 31 uh, board policies and we have been uh, scrubbing them and bringing them up to date to match all of the uh, uh, regulations and laws. Um, and to date, uh, we have 12 complete. We have five uh, on the docket for board to review of which we are going to do four tonight, and one of them is actually a revision of one that we've already completed, which was procurement, which has some um, values in there that are changing. Uh, and then we have uh, the balance uh, scheduled to be reviewed. And we really do spend some time scrubbing and making sure that they are uh, up to date. We add revisions to them, so now every three years they're looked at, so they'll never, ever fall behind again for as many years as they were left um, uh, without review. So we think we're in good shape. So in starting with that, I think we're, we're going to just go quickly, and I'll tell you what the changes are for policies 7, 9, 17, and 27 and 31. So for policies. Yeah, yes. So are we going to take a policy of time and talk about it as opposed to? Whatever you'd like to do. We don't have the policy <coughs> review committee anymore. You wanted to dissolve that, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, but I mean, we're gonna. Not, you're not gonna go through all the changes. No. Nope. All of them. We'll do them one at nope. a time. No, I was just gonna give you a general change. Oh. Just a general. So, for example, in policy number seven, paid sick leave. In general, it is updating and providing more responsibility to the GM, and the department managers, and the HR. Uh, to ensure that there is no sick time abuse um, and to monitor uh, sick time and time off, that it's in accordance with the laws, uh, with the RMLD um, um, collective bargaining agreements, which is where it indicates what each unit uh, is entitled to for their sick time. So that's basically all it's doing is increasing the responsibility that comes under the managers. Okay, so is this an appropriate time to ask a question or make a comment for that policy? <coughs> sure. Yeah. Dave. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I just had a question on. Uh, Dave Hennessy. Dave Talbot, did you have a comment on policy seven before I. No, I'm sorry. I, uh, I was. Uh, no, that was a, a stray comment. Not directed. Okay. <coughs> All right, so. Nope. No. Uh, so on. Po on Section three, paid sick leave and buyback benefits. Right. So if I read it correctly, it sounds like the union employees and non-union management are eligible, but on, under C, on the last page, I, my, really my question is, if I'm reading it right, non-union employees don't get, uh, aren't eligible for the benefit? Am I reading that right? Um, other other non-union employees probably meaning um, people that come in yeah, yeah, I'm really talking about, so other, yeah, so other, well, if you're a non-union employee, because point, point A is union employees, right? So that's, that's clear. B is non-union management. Right. And then C is temporary employees and other non-union, uh, which I'm taking me non-management. So a non-management, Yeah, non-union, non-union, non -management, correct. They don't, they don't have sick, uh, right. they don't. So, and th the sick buyback, um, you know, obviously at one point in time it was unlimited. Yeah. And we've worked hard to reduce that down with new hires being at 30 days. And um, so some people at 60 days. And we've, we've actually gotten less than yeah. what the town threshold is. But. Um, yeah. Colleen, I guess it just, yeah. it may be this uh, a, a historical reason. But so if I'm a non union, non-management employee working for RMLD, I don't have that benefit, sick, no. sick leave? No, uh, sick buyback, right? Well, it says paid sick leave and buyback benefits. Right. So the non-union, non-management employees don't get paid sick leave. Correct. Okay. I guess I'm we don't have very many non-union, non-management employees, do we? Yeah. Uh, we, we had hired <coughs> Someone, for example, oh. that we would not do 
Okay, let me, let me, uh, I think I, let me frame it a little differently. So effectively, if you're, anyone not in the union is, is a management employee, there isn't anybody else other than temps. Right, so right? It's, it's, it's hired by the RMLB, not by a temp agent. Yeah, 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 but I'm just saying there's really no non-union, right. non-union, non-management employees to cover. It's right? a unique situation when it happens, okay. All right, okay. All right. That was all my. Okay. Good question. Like a co-op Good. student. <coughs> yeah, I just thought. Example. I just some companies have right. a mix of union and non-union. They're not management. I guess is my point. Yeah. That's okay. Not true here. I guess. Good. Okay. Okay. So, that's the only changes to that. So, do we need to approve these? Do uh, we do uh, one as we're going through them? Do we do them in? I think a it's a motion with all of them at once. All right. I mean, if we don't want to approve some of them. Okay, why don't we go okay. through them all, yeah. and then if we feel uncomfortable about any one of them, we'll just take that and so delay it to next time. Okay. Okay. Okay, in, in policy number nine, uh, in section two, uh, the under authority, the cha they changed chapter 164, section uh, 56D of the threshold from 25,000 to 50,000 per the new law. So that's the only change in that. And, and that will get updated as those thresh thresholds change. Great. Okay. okay. That's the only uh, change to that. And you had previously approved this, so this is just a change to the law. Okay. The previous uh, commissioner vote date on that. Um, was 12-15-2016. Okay. Right. Does anyone have it? I don't have any questions. No, I mean, it's just a change to the law, so that one's pretty yeah. self-explanatory. Okay. <coughs> okay, policy 17, tuition reimbursement. Um, it, out, it outlines the approved areas of study and also clarifies eligible expenses. We need clarification on that. Um, and we're also allowing, uh, they have this new thing with students that go to school. It used to be that you pay, it, it, it's like you have to pay up front, but now the school is willing to um, defer it. Really? Yeah, because they want to encourage everyone to go to school, but a lot of times the students don't have the money to go up front. Mm -hmm. And so if the company agrees to it, nothing comes out of the company's funds and the student still has to get an A or better or a B or better in order to get their reimbursement if it's approved uh, course of study. Um, but the school and, and if the, if the um, company is willing, will wait till the end um, and it works really well and it gives more people that's an great. opportunity. So that's clarified in here and th those are the only changes. Okay. I had a question yep. if I could. Um, <clears throat> oh, I didn't see in here uh, and perhaps it's, it's embedded in it. But when I went through it, I mean, I know that uh, like Phil and Wendy probably go for like CPI credits and, and whatnot where you have to maintain a certain level of education. Um, I, I used to do it in professional services when I worked for Deloitte. Uh, and, and you do those on a yearly basis in courses. Every two years. Every, Every two, two years. years for me. Right. Yeah, HR is the same. And yeah. HR is the same way. Yeah. So I, I didn't see that sort of specifically called out as reimbursable. But yet, it's an educational and. An Typically, and maybe Wendy can help me on this one. But for all the career development plans that I've um, produced for each job description, if they have particular courses they, they have to take in order to keep their credentials up, it's it's considered in under the CDPs as training. So ah, if they okay, receive, very good. Receive the, um, you know, their continuing uh, uh, education credits. It works that way. But it's under their training obligations for, for okay, continuing great. proficiencies. Yeah, that, that handles that. Yeah, and some of what John said, I assume if someone wanted to take uh, a, either a webinar, a, pay, a paid for, we that you have to pay for a webinar, or uh, a lot of them are, you know, uh, workshops that organizations hold, would they would just probably expense that? Is that how it's made? Yes. Yeah. So that, that might not necessarily come under tuition reimbursement, per right, se. Exactly. But it has to be in their career development. You, you no longer can just take classes willy-nilly. It has to be in your agenda of proficiency <coughs> so you, for you <coughs> to meet your progression. So if, the, if they're going to take a webinar, it has to meet a criteria that's on their career development. So, uh, okay. so I had a couple of questions uh, as well. Um, 
so uh, under uh, number four under uh, Roman numeral three, so <coughs> just to make sure I understand it, so if you had an employee, let's say he's an engineer and he's not going for a particular degree, but he wants to take, you know, some new state of the art, you know, course, uh, is that not eligible? Because I, I, I could see in vision, I know in my own company, sometimes it doesn't always start out as I want to get a degree. It starts out I want to get educated and improve myself, and then, oops, I took four of these. If I do seven more, <laughs> I can get a, you know, a certificate or a degree. So uh, I'm just wondering if that's limiting in terms of, especially someone newer to the organization that might be out of school for a bit, and they, not, they don't necessarily have a targeted degree in mind. You know what I'm saying, Colleen? Um. So would that is that is there room in the approval process to do that? Because it, it seems to me it could be career related. It just isn't necessarily tied to. I don't. I'm not sure. I want to, you know, stand up and sign up for the two year certificate. But clearly, getting that education is a value right. in its development. But right. Um, in in that respect, if someone wasn't going for a degree and there wasn't an, uh, like a simple online class or a webinar or something like that, and the only way they were going to gain this type of experience, and it's in their career development, then it, we may make an isolated exception to one course at a college, okay? Because actually we had an employee take project management, and it was a course, a, a short course that was offered at Boston College, uh, UMass, Law. UMass Law. Yeah. So that does uh, happen. Uh, it's isolated, it's not part of a degree program. Um, it, we do recognize that once you get into a degree program, you still have to take humanities and things like that, no, that, I saw that, 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 that are part of that. Yeah. But no, you wouldn't be able to just go take any course that you liked that didn't have anything to do with you. Yeah, no, I'm talking about it clearly. Uh, it's an engineer, it's an engineering course that just isn't tied to a particular certification no, or degree. Not unless it's part of a degree and they took it as an elective. No, we wouldn't pay for that. Is there any reason we wouldn't? I mean, it's, it seems like it would fit the general. Well, if they could prove that that's, I mean, you know, I've, I've taken a lot of engineering courses that I'm not using today. I, I'm not sure that there would be classes that if you weren't taking a degree that we would think that that money would be spent better otherwise. That's why their career development programs are specifically tailored for exactly what it is that they need. Yeah. And, they, and it takes a lot just to get all that training done. Never How mind. flexible are the career development plans? Because part of what I'm sort of poking at is, uh, you know, Sometimes people start out in a particular area and they, they kind of migrate to a different area through exposure, understanding. So, I mean, it's extremes. You don't want to pay for some courses like, you know, right. you know, basketball or something. But, you know, there is something to be said. Education, there's lots of education that doesn't tie directly to what right. your, your career development plan may be today, but that might tomorrow. But so someone had a career development plan, I guess the question is could they come talk to their supervisor right. and maybe yes. have that? We, we have people that are uh, looking at being successors for someone else in the company. Yep. And if, they're, if their job description already provides somewhat of a backup to that function, something like that would be approved. So I guess it would be a case-by-case -case basis. But, you know, we, we have a, a, a budget for training, and, and, it's, and it's pretty tight. And now with OSHA coming on board, you know, making sure skill sets and proficiencies are really going to be important. So. In, in most cases, we try to st stick to the script, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and then my last question, I, I don't, don't think I saw, I just wondered, it, it doesn't appear that there's a, uh, a requirement or opportunity for supervisory approval for tuition reimbursement. Is that intentional or do we, do we think that's necessary? Uh, uh, that's on the form. Do you have a form attached at the back? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Maybe I just didn't <coughs> get that so I know HR has to sign it. I know mm -hmm. you signed it, Colleen. But uh, the reason I'm thinking of that is there may be a one of its knowledge, right? Because it'd be nice for the employee to know the, that the supervisor <laughs> knows that they're doing it. Yeah, and sometimes the supervisor may not approve it, right, for different reasons. So it, I just was curious if, if that was intentional or if maybe that happens or organically here. I don't know. You know what, Tom? I think that's a good catch. Um, Generally, Colleen doesn't sign. I mean, it yeah, I, I, yeah, you know, I. Supervisor signs. But you're right. Yeah. I, I I don't sign I anything yeah. that hasn't been initialed by yeah. the supervisor yeah. submitting it, and they and when this comes in, even though this form doesn't have the supervisor mm -hmm. on it, they have to submit 
where their budget's going to yeah. cover it. But you're absolutely right. I can certainly change the form yeah, to add the supervisor's that. signature. <coughs> Excellent. Good. That's all I got. Okay. Anybody else have any questions on this policy? Okay. 27. Okay. 27. Um, Just electronic device. Yeah, it's electronic. Uh, this was basically updated to add our NERC cybersecurity <coughs> requirements adher adherence and, um, yeah, it's a compliance for NERC for cybersecurity. As an electric utility, as you know, uh, NERC is very stringent with all utilities and we go through, we pretty much have full-time people watching NERC security alerts and making sure that all of our uh, firewalls and, and everything that is isolated electrically that protects our substations in any type of attack, um, whether it's a cyber attack or a physical attack. Um, we have lots and lots of compliance um, policies that we have to show on a very regular basis, once a month at least, that we are, and, and they continue to write them. So as new people develop ways to hack into systems, it's nonstop. <coughs> so we, we have to update this to, to make sure that we're um, adhering to those. And if anybody's interested in our NERC compliance program, I'd be glad to, to, to walk you through that. It's, it's a pretty substantial um, process that we go through. We even have an outside consultant that helps us because it's such a large volume of work. But we've just had audits. Yeah, we just have passed the audits. We just Pass the audit with flying colors, so we're good. Excellent. Great. All right. I have one comment yep. on that. And that's under the section D uh, for the Board of Commissioners. Uh, and if you walk. D on the first page? D on the second page. D. Second page. Okay, okay, D, yep. D is in dog. Um, on one, two, three, four, five, six. So the seventh line down um, cautioned against using email to communicate with other board members except for purely procedural or housekeeping matters. I'd like to add into that. Um, uh, or distribution of data or timely articles uh, or information that may prove useful for the entire board. And what I mean by that is uh, when we have a, um, an, an issue that we may be dealing with, whether it's solar or whether it's uh, large customers that are in our environment that are facing um, issues, uh, there's a lot of data that exists in the outside world. and rather than accumulate that data and then bring it to the meeting and we all think about it and talk about it, uh, it's much more efficient to circulate the data without any comments on it, but just to circulate the data or the articles themselves because it provides, I think, a much more timely and effective forum for us all to see that and to talk about it in, obviously, here uh, at the meeting. But it just del if we don't do that, it just delays it by about a month or longer. And I think uh, in this world we yeah. shouldn't delay things. So if you know, Mr. Chim, maybe yeah. a suggestion would be where, except for purely educational, comma procedural, or housekeeping matters. I That'd like be that fine. Too. Educational. Just add one word. Just add one word. Educational with a comma. <laughs> All right. We had thought of that. <laughs> That's all right. You explained it well. <laughs> Not well. You enough. did it in paragraphs. He did it with one word. <laughs> but he, but well, consultants are easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting paid by the hour. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a couple of comments. If oh yeah. Appropriate. So yeah. Uh, one, uh, one I guess is just to, it's, it's just logic if, if, if I'm reading it right. So on page two under permitted use. Uh, the, the second sentence, incidental and occasional brief personal use is permitted during non-working hours as long as such use does not interfere with any employee's work or violate this. So it, if it's personal use, non-working hours, it really wouldn't interfere with work, would it? Unless they were on standby or something. Uh, it was meant for breaks. And oh. Yeah. Oh, so the language was changed <coughs> from employee breaks and then the lunch period. That's what that meant by okay. not working out. Oh, as opposed to at nighttime. Or yeah. Like that. Uh, lunch hour could apply for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, but even then, I suppose you could say during that time, they're not, there's no ex expectation to work, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a minor, I guess it just struck me as. Yeah. Uh, mm. Uh, on a more substantive 
vein. So at the end of number three, the rule of thumb, which I don't totally disagree, but I, I guess I'd like to suggest an add-on. So the useful rule of thumb, when in doubt, don't. Uh, I mean, it seems to me the other option is to ask, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, if there's no one to talk to, then I would say don't, but it would seem to me that uh, something uh, may just need clarification. So if other ones, others feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. Ask is a good, good, uh, I think that's a good add. Yep. Okay. So cross don't and put ask? Correct. Or don't and ask or? Well, ask just, just even don't. ask because then you could get a don't or you could go, it's okay. Okay, I like it. Um, All right. The only other question I had, and I don't really, uh, I'm not current on it. So some of you know, so there's a, a global uh, data protection uh, regulations, you know, that's chaos gathering a lot of, I'm sure all, a lot of you are affected by in the companies. I don't know it, that it really affects RMLD, but I know in Massachusetts there was a, a big data protection and that there's actually uh, uh, work done and I thought of policies in place, but I, I haven't been involved directly in that. So I guess the, my question is, is there any other, uh, uh, under the, I don't know if it's the data protection. Do we have any separate policy that deals with data protection, or is this really the right piece for yeah, that? Yeah, this is. Yeah, I guess it's just around. Uh, Bill, I don't know, you must have had some exposure to that, right? Uh, there's Massachusetts data protection mm -hmm. laws that. Uh, yeah, the only thing I have to protect is I got to make sure I protect data, sensitive data, like social security numbers. Yeah, that I have. well, I mean, if we're in that same right. business, right? Right, yeah. Well, yeah. we have so Massachusetts record keeping that we have to follow. Yeah, right. I mean, that's yeah. So it's really, I'm just posing the question. I don't know if there's any other, uh, you know, there's if been I a lot of. If I have to send something to somebody, I have to send it encrypted. You know, if it has that kind of information yeah, in it, it's that like kind of social security. I've got yeah. clients that can't figure yeah. out how to encrypt it, but it's all in the story. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I guess I would not hold up approving the policy, but maybe something we want to do a little more. I'll see if I get a little more information uh, on it as well. But uh, It would be for another yeah. policy, it sounds like. Not for maybe, or yeah. it could be for a future. I, mean, I don't have anything hard to suggest there, but uh, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of uh, tension now getting you know, for obvious reasons, you know, with cyber security and yeah. how information mm -hmm. gets uh, transmitted, not just for us, but for vendors and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, that's all I got. So we'll be able to still vote on this with those conditions of the yeah. informational well, and Jim, what ask. I suggest yeah. is that we vote on this one separately where we got changes. Okay, so I'll that's fine. I'll make a motion to um, approve uh, the RMLD policy 27. With the changes on um, in section, what is it two, double I, um, item D, that we add the word educational, comma before procedural or housekeeping matters. Okay. And on page three, which is uh, section two, section three, oh. under permitted use, the last item under uh, section B is that we replace the word add, add, we replace the word don't with ask. Okay. And second. 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 All right. I guess we already had our discussion, but any more discussion? All Paul O'Rourke, aye. Dave Hennessy, aye. Mr. Pacino, aye. Mr. Stempak, aye. Mr. Talbot, aye. All right. So yeah. do we want to go back and do the other two? So no, we no, we can get them all. The other, we can do we all We still have, have, we have a change on one of them, remember, on the tuition. We have a change on the tuition reimbursement oh, yeah, to add right. the supervisor. So we'll do that one the same way, okay. just to be consistent. <coughs> I just thought we would change the form. Okay. Yeah, we can change the form. Well, it's this fine. one we can batch then. Yeah, but the okay. form yeah, is part of the form. policy, isn't it? Or is it? The ask is part of the policy. All right. Okay. We'll do it twice. All right, I'll move we approve policy 17 with the change in the uh, attachment A that there be a line added for uh, the supervisor, the supervisor's signature and date. Okay, second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Tom O'Rourke, aye. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Ms. Pacino, aye. Mr. Stempak, aye. Mr. Talbot, aye. All right. Okay. okay, the last one is uh, policy 31 for vehicle use. Um, and we, with our PERMA insurance company, we have a, a little folders and how you, um, what you have to, the information you have to write down if you get in an accident, what you're supposed to do, who you hand that into, who you need to notify. And it's all in a little packet in each glove compartment. So basically, we, we've attached that to the back. Um, and we re-emphasized that in some of the, in, in all of the collective bargaining agreements, including imposed on myself and all of the senior managers, um, any accidents that occur that involve any type of drinking or death 
or anything like that nature, there are cases where you have to call into a supervisor here, notify them of the accident, you will be brought to be tested. So that was put in here as a reminder to follow the collective bargaining agreement and also policy 26 that affects non-union personnel like senior managers. Um, so the actual accident <coughs> report to fill out uh, notifications on um, what needs to happen if, if there's a loss of life or uh, there's a couple lists of things that occur. And then um, we, we spent a lot of time on the hands-free cell phone use, clarifying that uh, there's no using of any apps on handheld devices while driving RMLD vehicles. And the reason why it was a little bit difficult is because a lot of people misunderstand the word text. A text is a, is a character. And, and people say, well, I wasn't texting, I was reading. It's like, no, you can't do any of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's absolutely hands-free. Actually, uh, in a couple of the states now, you have to put your phone in the glove compartment. And if you can use that phone while it's in the glove compartment, then you can use it. So everything is completely hands-free. So you can yell to Siri in the glove compartment. If she hears you and she dials for you, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we, that's not our state law right now. Mm -hmm. So we're following Massachusetts state law, but we wanted to clarify that texting is reading, uh, it's, it's physically texting, it's manipulating any apps on your phone, it's touching your phone, it's, it's gotta be hands-free so that it's quite clear with all of the employees. So that was one of the major uh, things because we have tablets in the car now. So the whole GIS and all of our work order system and everything is now on those tablets. So if your crewmate can manipulate it while you're driving, but otherwise you need to pull to the side of the road in order to, mm. to do any of this, answer a phone call, whatever. Okay, so that was, that was kind of the area that, um, you know, we spent s uh, some time doing a little bit of research. Those are the changes to that. It's great. All right. Yep. Yep. Good. Any um, questions by anybody on this one? Yep. Clarifications? All right. I think we can fill you. Want to do a motion on all three right. of these? Seven. <coughs> so what we got? We got seven. Is it seven, nine? And Thirty-one. Seven, nine, and thirty-one. Right. Check the right ones. Move that uh, the commission approve uh, the changes to policy number seven, sick leave benefits. Number nine, RMLD procurement. And number 31, vehicle use on the recommendation of the general manager. All right. A second? second. Second. All right. Discussion? All those in favor? Tom O'Rourke, aye. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Mr. Pacino, aye. Mr. Stempeck, aye. All right. Motion carries five to zero. And all the motions carried five to zero. So we're, we're set. That was the policy committee. In a May I make one more comment before we move on? Yes. Um, just so everyone knows, as a reminder, that you know, state employees will now be uh, have to be in compliance with OSHA as of February 2019. Uh, I want all of my commissioners to know and the public to know that I think we're in very, very good shape. Um, Hamid and I brought in very strong uh, safety policies when we came. Uh, we have some logistics that we have to address um, uh, that I think in this training that's coming up will help to answer. Like if you hire a contractor, are you responsible for all the tools on his truck? I mean, things like that, that, that we have to sift out. But we have um, a trainer coming in uh, next Thursday. Uh, we're having an open meeting for everyone in the company to be able to ask questions. I'm preparing questions and w it's gonna be very transparent. And then at the end of the summer, we're doing a self audit. It's a two day self audit where he will come back and he will audit everything as if he is OSHA. And then on the third day, he'll write a report. Um, kind of a practice. Oh, sure. It's like a practice, but it'll give us plenty of time to, um, you know, to, to make sure that we're, everything is, is right where it should be and that all of the employees are on board uh, and, uh, and we're good to go. Because, you know, if, if, if someone's to come out in the field within your work zone, you know, you want to have a good attitude, you want to, you know, be respectful, understand what they're saying, we want to have a process of, of how it's communicated. Uh, but I think I think we'll have everyone ready for any type of inspection that that comes in going forward. That's great. So, yeah. So, so calling two questions. One, yep. When is it effective? February 2019. Okay. Uh, so we don't need it certainly for this year. But I'm wondering if it would be a good idea, since we haven't had the obligation to comply, uh, if we could add, uh, give some time for you to think about 
some some metrics when we do our normal mo monthly report out. So you know, because eventually, uh, I think you have to report OSHA OSHA recordable incidents and other right. you know, items. So I think to have that visibility in our monthly meetings would be good. I don't okay. know if that's necessarily monthly, right. maybe it's quarterly, but right. you know, just so uh, get the board used to seeing that information. <coughs> Well, we follow the APPA manual, which is OSHA-based, and we have a number of policies that Hamid and I have written on OSHA right. policies and procedures, and that combined with our safety committee makes up our safety yeah. program. Right. Uh, so we've always been following them. Sure. And OSHA's always been there, so even though you, you don't have to be compliant, if there's ever an accident, the Department of Labor would use OSHA standards in order to come right. in to do the investigation, so that's why it was always a good idea to follow that as a best utility practice. Yep. Um, good. So... But you're absolutely right. There will be metrics and, and uh, reports that will have to go out, but um, I'm counting on that there will be none. Yep. So. Good. All right, thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, I think we're um, coming up to you, Jane. Is that right? Yes, integrated resources. The Chair, so um, well, since we just went through it, so do I know it worked fine for me. Is this a good process then to go forward in the policies? I think it worked for you. <coughs> I th what do you guys think? I think I, I think it's a real time saver. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it requires some time to discuss, but it's, I think, more efficient. But we would spend some time on this anyway yeah, right. Right. in the general meeting yep. going through this yep. a little bit. So now we just kind of put yep. it all together. Yep. So and, and, we, and we get it beforehand to review, so right. we can ask the questions. Right. So. Tracy got it to us well in advance. Yeah, it was great. And we get everybody's in input instead of just... Right, a just the committee, and three, then the committee right. has to go and get it approved, and then back, he has right. Right, much more efficient. Thanks. I'm here to report on the April uh, 2018 purchase power. Yeah. Um, Sorry, can you, you want to hit the lights a little bit? Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> now, Neil, you'll be here to put them on. So <laughs> it's, a, it's not a narrow. Mm -hmm. Tom, okay. at, the, at the end of last meeting, we sat in the dark after the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this first slide looks at the capacity requirements and the embedded costs for the, for the month of April, and it looks back from 2014 to 2018. Uh, so you can see in 2014, the first bar chart, our capacity requirement was 215,566 kW, um, and our average cost per kW was $10.25. If you uh, fast forward to 2018, you see a significant increase. Um, although our, our capacity requirement was 222,431 kW, our average cost to supply that was $13.56. And as we had been talking over the last three years, um, effective in this capacity year was that increase in NEMA capacity zone. So we went from the $3 um, for the ISO exchange to the $15. And so that resulted in a, approximately a 16 percent increase in capacity costs for this year. Um, so it was about a three million dollar annual increase and again this is just the April snapshot and, and so you can see with the green line going up significantly for the average cost of capacity. Um, I'd like to also remind you based on this slide that our capacity is based on our summer peak from last year and so um, Joyce has already started our Shred the Peak campaign. We saw um, that this week, yeah. right? Correct. Mm -hmm. On Monday, week. we had um, a very hot day. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a list of about 2,000 customers that have opted in to participate in our Shred the Peak. So all that participation, along with all of our efforts to reduce our summer demand, go into these costs hopefully coming down in the future. And so I encourage all our customers who are watching to participate in that program. What was the high point of the day? Um, the peak actually occurred between 6 and 7 o'clock, and for us it wasn't an all-time peak. Our overall peak for uh, Monday was about 135 megawatts. Uh, that compares to about 153 last year. Um, so we'll have to see if this remains to be the summer peak or if we'll actually have a summer this, this year. It, it probably will not be the summer uh, peak. Most likely it won't be. <laughs> How can people participate, Jane? Can you tell Sure. Uh, listeners again. Sure. Uh, we tweet that we tweet when we are predicting or when we're anticipating that it may be a peak day. Uh, we have an email. Uh, they can contact us through the website and sign up to, to opt into our Shred the Peak campaign. Uh, when they do that, we'll send them out an email to say today's a, a potential peak day between the hours of 
6 to se uh, six to 8 o'clock, we, we are anticipating our peak, and then we give them a list of things. Don't run your dishwasher or dryer till after those hours. Grill out as opposed to running your stove or oven. Um, and then you can consume, uh, resume your regular duties after that, of, after that uh, short period of window of time. Right. The second slide looks at our purchase power embedded costs for fuel. Uh, the purple line uh, indicates our kilowatt hours purchased. And as you can see in April, there's kind of a decline, uh, our, our declining line if you were to trend those. Um, so this past April, uh, our purchases, which is reflective of somewhat of our sales, have been down significantly. Um, and then, uh, in spite of that, our average cost of, uh, of power is still under five cents. Um, so we've been able to take advantage of some low um, natural gas costs. Um, we're, um, we've entered into a short-term arrangement where we're laddering and layering on an ongoing basis as, as costs come down, so that's been attractive. Um, and so we hope to, to keep our energy costs low or um, declining to help levelize the overall cost of uh, energy that our consumers have to purchase. And the last cost looks at the transmission cost. So those are the three components that make up the purchase power, our capacity, energy, and transmission cost. And this looks at April, a five-year period from 2014 to 2018. Um, and um, just so people are aware, the way our transmission costs are uh, allocated and socialized throughout New England, um, we get, we, get 90% of our transmission costs get charged through us through ISO New England and that's that's um, known as regional network service and so all of the transmission upgrades throughout New England um, those costs get socialized throughout everybody in New England and that's based on our monthly peak coincident with the transmission provider so we're interconnected to both National Grid and Eversource and on a monthly peak and that it's not necessarily the same peak for ever eversource and national grid um, we look at those hourly so those get reported to the iso and based on those peak hours we get allocated 90 percent of our costs um, so in april there's a there's a there's a one month lag so we were billed actually for our march transmission um, and so um, the difference in April, or again, it's our March transmission costs. Um, in 2016, uh, when you look from 15 to 16, we had a 9.4 megawatt drop uh, in that month. So that allowed us to de decrease our costs. Um, these rates are based on that monthly peak as well as those regional network charges. And those have been going up anywhere from 2 to 12 percent, and they average around 6 percent increase annually and um, unfortunately because of the way that the formula is those um, you transmission utilities uh, get a return on their investments uh, and so those costs are forecasted to just continue on an upward trend um, so right now we're paying about ten dollars a kw month and those are, are projected to escalate around six percent every every year going forward oh. And what percent of like of a rate payers bill? What percent of it is transmission? Cost? Uh, that's a very good question. So, of the overall purchase power, just to give you a, a, an example for this fiscal year, we're forecasting around seventy million dollars for purchase power, and transmission costs are about fourteen million dollars of that. Okay. Uh, capacity is around twenty-three million, and fuels around thirty-one million. So it's around thirty, twenty, forty-six in terms of capacity transmission fuel okay. ballparkish all right so, okay. and that okay. would conclude concludes my por my report however I do have two other items under my um, item okay uh, any any questions for Jane about her what she's already presented mm -hmm. No. Okay, you got other items you want to yeah, talk about? Ben Diverge, who works uh, in IRD, is going to talk about our pilot EV program. All and right. then Joyce is going to talk about community relationship and she's going to do uh, a demonstration on the, the new website. Great.
Um, my name is Ben Verge. I am a resource specialist here in the Integrated Resources Division. I mostly focus on our residential rebate programs. Um, so that would include the electric vehicle rebate program, pilot program we're starting, as well as um, the Energy Star Appliance rebate program, which is one of our most popular programs. Um, so we have started a pilot program for this summer um, regarding the plug-in electric vehicles. Uh, we're calling it the Electrify Your Ride. Um, so um, basically, I'm gonna go over some basics about electric vehicles, why this could be good for, why this is going to be good for RMLD, um, including basically that savings are uh, based in the thousands of dollars over the lifetime of the vehicle between the cost of gasoline and the price of electricity. Uh, they reduces the creation of greenhouse gases uh, in the transportation sector, which is one of the areas that, as Massachusetts, is trying to focus on. Um, and in New England itself, electricity production uses natural gas and other renewables, which is a cleaner source of fuel than using traditional oil. Um, so looking at the actual math of it, um, that basically it prices out using RMLD's average residential rate of 16 cents. It averaged out that um, an electric gallon, also known as an e-gallon, is about $1.17, uh, which equivalent, the average gas price um, when I was looking at this was $2.95. So looking at it and a sense of what would, if a customer pays it, how much they're paying for per gallon. If they're on the time of use rates around 13, paying around 13, cent, doll, 13 cents per kilowatt hour, the average is 95 cents per gallon. The residential rate, like I said, is $1.17. Comparatively speaking, in an investor owned utility such as National Grid, which is around 23 cents per kilowatt hour, the price per gallon is a dollar sixty-eight, which is still lower than the cost of a regular priced gallon. To get that price point at which it's equal to a gallon of gasoline, you'd have to pay forty cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so these, even then, this which we are nowhere near that as of currently. So it's a tr tremendous advantage to driving one of these then, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Cost, cost effectively, factor. yes. Yeah. Um, so looking at it, like I said, look, as, uh, looking at it in basically to drive 100 miles, per se, to say, um, on a <coughs> gas using that 295, um, and the average fuel efficiency of, t basically the average fuel efficiency of a car is about 25 miles. Per uh, gallon per mile, it would cost about eleven dollars and seventy cents, which is about fourteen hundred dollars annually. Uh, that's averaging uh, twelve thousand, basically average of twelve thousand miles driven in a year. Taking um, the sixteen cents per kilowatt hour that we pay in Reading, uh, multiplied by the uh, base average charge is point. 329 kilowatt hours to charge per mile is a cost of four dollars and 64 cents to drive 100 miles which is about 550 dollars per uh so taking that it's about 850 dollars saved annually um to drive an electric vehicle so there are three types of electric vehicles uh, that we'll talk about uh, plug-in electric hybrids or PHEV which is both battery and conventional gas engine and once that uh, battery is fully depleted the gas engine kicks in hey Dave. Um, typically and then it will have overall have lower emissions than a conventional gas only vehicle these regular ones are the battery capacity is less than 10 kilowatt hours uh, to, meaning it drives around um, anywhere from 
10 to 30 miles an hour, anywhere from 10 to 30 miles on the electric battery. A plug-in electric hybrid plus or PHEV plus is the same exact as a PHEV, uh, but the battery capacity is greater uh, than 10 kilowatt hours, uh, meaning that the vehicles typically drive more like around 50 to 60 miles, uh, probably 40 to 60 miles um, on the electric battery before the, um, and then a battery electric vehicle or BEV is 100% electric. There's zero tailpipe emissions at all. So it's 100, there's 100%, um, there's no gasoline, no oil. Um, that would be, the, those included in that category would be the Tesla or the Bolt, uh, Chevy Bolt. Uh, like yeah, a, I could stop and So, um, Can you hear me? Yes. Are we still talking about the electric car? Yes. 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 Um, Let me know when I have a question about that. Let me know and I'll be able to ask it. Okay. okay. Um, so charging, uh, typically the, most customers will choose to charge at home using either level one or level two charging. Uh, level one is a standard household 120 volt outlet. It takes on uh, an hour's charge, you'll gain about two to five miles on your battery. Uh, level two is a 240 volt charger and an hour's charge, you'll gain about 10 to 20 miles on your battery. Uh, level two style charging is, uh, what's known as destination charging. I mean, you're going to be spending a lot of time at that location, so typically home or uh, workplace charging stations uh, as well. Uh, DC, the third type uh, that you'll see on the highways is the DC fast charge, which is about 480 volts. And that in a 20 minute charge will give you about 60 to 80 miles. Um, so, you'll start seeing is you'll have start seeing public charging stations are becoming more popular like we have just installed a level two here at rmld a couple months ago but also seen at hotels shopping centers uh, in public parking lots and parking garages um, when you're out on the road as an electric vehicle driver there's multiple options you can find to locate these charging stations uh, there are public information ones which is plug share uh, which is driven by consumers that they put the information up there. They're able to register that information. The Department of Energy has the Alternative Fuels Data Center, which has a ma map that pro plots them. And then networked chargers such, uh, that specifically run and own those charging stations, such as ChargePoint and EVgo, along with others, will have their own apps or means to locate those charging stations on the road. Um, this map is currently showing the area around our uh, Reading Territory. Um, the, these are all public access stations, so the ones that public can access. Um, the number one um, here is our, lo is our terminal outside this building. The two is uh, Cornerstone Mitsubishi up on, in Wilmington. And then number three on the corner uh, 128 and 93 is Osram America. Um, there are also charge, uh, workplace charging stations that have been installed at analog devices as well as Teradyne. And uh, one just uh, facility was just completed at um, Columbia Construction. Thank you. Can I ask you a question on that? Yes. Um, the I'm sure there there are apps. I, I know for t for example, Tesla has like shows you where the charging stations are on their screen when you're looking to to charge. But do they also show when they're busy, like someone's using them? Because there may be one or two. Yes. Right? So uh, PlugShare does that. Um, I I know ChargePoint does that as well. Because um, you'd hate to drive there and find out. Yeah. There's somebody waiting for 20 minutes. You know? Yeah. Um, I know. Charge point, um, theirs does. They do that. They, they there are X number of terminals here at this location, and there right. there are one ones being used right now. So there's five open, okay. um, or something like that. Um, the same I deal with plug share here because this also does plots out where they are 
where they are if it's, if something's under constr- if one is under service as well um, or that they also locate that um, so there is it Great. does yeah thank you um, to help with the cost and implementation there have been uh, there's m- multiple rebates and incentives currently uh, the federal tax credit as op- is offering anywhere from 2,500 to 7,500. That depends on the capacity of the battery of the vehicle. Uh, the state is offering a rebate through the more EV program, anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500, and that depends on the vehicle type. Um, they've specifically categorized that. And then the Mass Energy Consumer Alliance has a program, Drive Green, which they have worked with dealerships and the manufacturers themselves to secure discounts um, at certain dealerships, and they work, uh, they check these re- the rebates, they check to make sure that the dealerships are offering the mess, they do that monthly. Um, so some re- deals with them will last only a couple months, um, but they try and do make sure it's the best for the consumer. And then we have just, ins- uh, which I will go into a little more detail in a bit, uh, have just implemented our pilot incentive program of offering $1,000 for plug-in hybrid uh, vehicles plus, so the greater than 10 kilowatt hour batteries, and then $1,500 for a battery electric vehicle. Um, so why we're doing this and why we've been incentiv- we've been previously inc- incentivized electric vehicle chargers um, is an average level two charger will use between two to 300 kilowatt hours per month which becomes out um, based on various um, rates in the territory that we offer, uh, will come out between about three to $600 additional revenue for us. That's per charging, per charging station. Um, this does also contribute to RMLD's Be Efficient, Get Greener, Go Paperless campaign and that this does shifts our territory into adopting technology that it's more greener, it, it reduces our emissions for this area. Um, and the updated EV charger rebate, um, it encourages customers to install networked uh, chargers that will potentially lead us to uh, possibly uh, implement a re- easier to implement a residential demand response program using those EVs so that we're not, uh, char- we can encourage those customers to charge off peak so that while we're encouraging them to charge and use our product that we're not um, incurring, we're ad- incurring additional cost for peak demand. Um, so we, as of June 1st, uh, we implemented a new uh, pilot program for offering for new, the purchase and lease of plug-in hybrid vehicle pluses, so the ones that are have a battery larger than 10 kilowatt hours Um, we're offering a thousand dollars for a new vehicle and if the a customer purchases or leases a new or used battery electric vehicle um, we're offering fifteen hundred dollars for that we also updated our residential ev charging station rebate we also updated our residential ev charging station rebate to include to uh, cover 100% of costs uh, up to $500 for the installation of a level two networked charger or smart charger. Um, so we're trying to encourage customers to adopt that technology. Hi, my, co- my call keeps cutting in and out. Why, why don't you ask it why now, Dave? Yeah, why don't ask it now? <laughs> Before we lose you again. Yeah. All right, go Dave. We're ready for your question. Dave. Cut out again. Yes. Yeah, we're ready for your question now. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, 
quick arm up, you can make that happen on its own, but if it's built into the planning process, maybe they can start starting up again. So if you want to, like, we have in our lot, which is starting up everywhere and then generating revenue for a long time. Um, it's good. Those level two ones are actually really, really helpful for anyone who wants to just pop up while they're doing a shopping area. You can add quite a bit of range if you're just there for 30 to 30 minutes to an hour. You know, I don't need to be in a full tank. But that is noticeable and it's really helpful to have that. So that's just one thought. Um, so that I know we have a member of the Board of Selectmen in the room and I don't know if that's one thing that can be brought back um, as an area yeah. to make sure we're can I expand on that? Across, you know, um, you know, entities. Because that's really good for this department and good for the town. Let him get in there. Um, another is okay. the demo. Um, I'm not so sure how important those are going to be going forward in terms of all the new models coming in and learning different things about them. They also cost a fortune. If you know how much they cost, they're like, there's got to be 50 or 100 grand for one of those things, right? Well, I didn't hear what you said. The Shademo, the really big ones that charge your whole car from 0 to 100 in 20 minutes or oh. 40 minutes. Those things are. Those DC those fast. Are No, uh, no, I was just, um, it was just a point of information that I was bringing up that there are, that it was a, an option out there, that it was, it was not right. one that we were okay. specifically looking at. I didn't know there was something we were trying to specifically promote, but I do think, you know, it'd be good to promote more of the level twos in more locations, and not just RMLD trying to make them happen, but that it's built into the route development and review process in the four towns, so that these things start going up. Okay. Okay. Well, Good. Is, how many other light departments are doing or actually giving people <coughs> tax rebates for buying electric cars? Are any, anybody doing that? Is Braintree doing that? They would be the ones that do it, right? Um, no, no. We are the only, currently, we're the only municipal in Massachusetts offering a rebate directly for cars um, for the purchase or lease of a car. They are offering as well a, lot, uh, a couple of the other municipals as well but they're offering OEM discounts um, right. is what's currently being advertised on their websites okay Dave, can you it's a very generous um, thing we've started to do hey Dave Dave yes. yeah you had asked me in an email just before the meeting uh, so what I had sent you was we're mandated at one quarter of one percent for our energy conservation fund we, we have right. to okay and that's the fund that's mandated by the state that we pay out for rebates and, and, and you know, we do a lot of analysis to, to make sure that even our appliance rebates are updated every year so that they're um, encouraging the most uh, conservation. This particular uh, fund is also what's funding this. We're having less people coming in on the solar rebate, so we want right. to encourage, which is a loss. I mean, it, it cleans the planet, but from an RMLD revenue perspective, it's, it's, it's a right. loss. Yep. But so this is using the same money. It's not an additional fund or anything uh, to, to pilot this for the summer to see if we can't um, generate some revenue. And the revenue so, oh, is it, electricity. And from people that means when you say generate revenue, you mean from people charging the cars that they purchase. Yeah, just to offset. Yeah, offset some of the kilowatt hour sales drop. But uh, so you asked what was left, and the the account, the one quarter one percent is seven. Two hundred thirty-five thousand dollars left. No, that's the total for okay. the residential. We've spent today about forty-five thousand on home energy audits, seventy-five thousand on residential audits, um, twenty thousand on solar re residential solar rebates, um, ten on the EV chargers, and four and a half thousand on geothermal. So we have about eighty-one thousand left. Um, 
the, the budget for this is 40,000 for the actual electric vehicle rebates and then some at, um, marketing and administrative budget. Do you get well, that, Dave? It's very, it's very, uh, it's very proactive to be really looking at the future here and planning for it. And um, like I said, it's, it's the props departments and, and town entities that would be good for thinking like this. And, and also not to jump ahead, but it's just something that I, it's been on my mind and on all of our minds um, that, you know, we had this conversation over the last year about, you know, how does the town and the RLB collaborate? And one topic of that conversation has been, well, how much more money can RLB give the town? And I've always thought, and I know with a fair amount of agreement that that was not a very productive conversation because it's just money coming out of another pocket. Um, but that this kind of thing and other kinds of ideas like this you know, can be really mutually uh, productive for the town and our LP, and it would be great to you know just kind of think like this. And what are the things we can do across the departments that have benefits for both sides um, when we think creatively about you know future technologies and um, you know just the areas of efficiency? So I've probably said things like this before, but it would be great to like try to get this type of thing on, on our radar screen. Good point, Dave. Uh, Phil, you have a comment, too? Yeah, I want to expand on, on one thing that Dave said. Um, I'm in the process of buying a new car right now. And I'm, I live at 5 Washington Street, which is a condo building. I actually look down into the parking lot of the, uh, the train station. You know, and there is really one of my concerns with buying a hybrid or any other kind of car is, you know, there's not really a very convenient, you know, charging station for me to go to at this point. So I, I think Davis hit upon something I was going to maybe bring up later on is the fact that, you know, the town has property at, around the railroad station. It would seem a much a logical place for a charging station to be somewhere in that railroad station area. And the town has that. And, I, and, and I'd like that message to be carried back. I'd like my liaison. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I'd like you to carry that message back that you know, I, I know parking sometimes down at the depot was rather inter rather interesting, but I mean maybe you look at the end. You know, I live on the Five Washy, which is the as you go up Movement Street on the first row on the right. That is a dead end, and there's nobody who parks. There's a there's nobody parked in, and maybe the guy who lives next door would be upset about that. But um, you know, that's a dead end. That'd be I, in my place. It'd be an ideal spot for a charging station because people can walk right over yeah, to the train so. station. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you, Phil. I think yeah. Yeah, so I'll yeah, just add that's, on. That's, that's all. I don't know if it is now. I doubt it is, mm -hmm. um, but it could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom. Yeah, so I guess in, in even a larger context, so Phil's given a, and Dave a good example of a, an application or a, a location, but I'm wondering if we, we couldn't do a, a broader scoping of, you know, starting with the whole universe of, the four towns, where would be some locations that make sense, and then maybe target them over not overnight, but over time. So, mm -hmm. so we don't do it. We do it not just opportunistically, but with a strategy in mind. Because at some point, you know, others will. You know, if we get get there first, you know, with the plan and have them, we're less likely to be. Uh, even though wherever they are benefit us, but I mean, we could take a more strategic approach. Yeah. We're yeah. developing a, a program so that, okay. you know, Jane's group, they'll be approaching Home Depot and other areas yeah. that have been strategically selected to support. Because I, I know there's a company out of Miami, a company named Blink, B-L-I-N-K. They've actually signed a contract with Amazon to put charging stations outside. I think it's Whole Food that Amazon owns. Mm -hmm. yep. They're actually signed a contract to put some uh, charging stations outside of Whole Food locations. Wow. It's a publicly traded company, Blink. 
So they would be uh, our, these, yeah, in would, your plan, they would be RMLD-owned charging stations? Well, RMLD is a franchise, so we, no one can sell, only we can sell power. And, right. Unless it's coming off of their meter and they're selling, you know, they're giving it free to their employees, it has to come through us. Okay, so anybody that's paying for electricity to charge a car right. has to be that's, an RMLD. Right, because this is a franchise, okay. that's but, correct. But what, what, what way around that? So you're saying that uh, the the charger is coming off of their meter, and they're making the money by charging a parking rent. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, maybe the analogy is, uh, you know, if I went to go get my uh, this is a ridiculous analogy, but um, let's say I went to get, get my hair done and I had my hair under the hair dryer. I'm not paying them for the electricity for the hair dryer. I'm paying them for their services or their time. Okay, well, yeah, we'll look into that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have another example, Jane? Well, yeah, it's like when you rent a campsite and you have electrical hookups or water hookups when you're camping, you're not paying for the electricity or the water, you're paying to rent the campsite. Right. right. That's, right. Another That's another good another example. Another yeah. As opposed to Dave's hair. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Nothing wrong with Dave's hair. No. <laughs> well. Dave, I think Vanessa had a Yes, Vanessa, you had a comment. Uh, Dave, I think this is a fantastic idea, and actually it's very timely. Yeah, well, Dave, 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 Dave's, Dave's talking, Vanessa. Yeah. Dave, no, Vanessa, Vanessa wanted to make a comment, Dave. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, Dave, I think this is a great idea, and your timing is great. The select board has had very preliminary conversations regarding the master plan, um, and I know the PPDC is updating their guidelines. Um, so oh, great. getting a group together, I think, um, to start pushing this forward now would be perfect. Great. Okay. Good. Great. Good. So how do, what's the recommendation? Select select board now, Dave. Select board they call yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> the select board. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sorry. So is there something that we should do next on this issue? Um, Just you said getting a group well, together. I think or? if if Vanessa wants some language from us, if we have any specs or any guidelines, you know, probably you know, summarizing the franchise and just to make sure that w whatever information gets put in that it follows, um, you know, not opening, we don't want to open up our territory by mistake, uh, retail territory, the home home uh, rule. So we'll just provide you some information for that. You can pass that along unless you want to give us a phone number for us to call them directly, whatever you want, whatever no, would I, be helpful. I think Okay. okay. All right. We can. Like mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, you, right. you put some information together for Vanessa. Okay. Great. Right. All right. And I think we cut you off. You're still. Ben, you're still. <laughs> you're still <laughs> you still have some things to do. Sorry. That was just a little <laughs> <laughs> break in the action. Um, so actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah I did. That last town meeting. I think it was the first. Last. Town oh, last town meeting. Last okay. town meeting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, apologize. No worries. Yeah. Um, so actually, I can report that as of yesterday, uh, our well, I should back up a step. Um, our goal is to get um, 30 vehicles for the five months, which is six vehicles per month. Um, and I can report that as of yesterday, we actually hit six applications, and they were all hey, approved. That's great. Congratulations. So, nice. Um, we have um, hit our goal, so. We're, but we're not stopping. Um, 
we're going to continue on. Um, so actually, as part of that, you might have a another sale right here. Go. <laughs> Sounds like number seven's coming. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so actually, as part of that is we're doing a marketing and education plan. Um, so we are doing putting a little effort into an educational arg <coughs> um, article series titled Electrify Your Ride. Um, that's going to be published in all of the newspapers, online on the patch, as well as our website. We're also going to tweet it out um, with the link to our articles on the website. Um, the first went, the first article went out last week, which was titled Why the Buzz About Plug-in EVs, kind of just spurring the general introduction as to why we're going to get into this, what, what we're doing. And then the second article is going to go out tomorrow is uh, plug-in electric vehicle 101 so the basics about it um, further topics are going to include uh, talking about rebates incentives how um, actually the next one after this is going to be how and where to charge your plug-in uh, the electric vehicle so we're kind of looking at the broader scopes to make sure that the public is educated about them um, so it's not to also to push them past the pilot to consider the electric vehicles as well um, once we, if we decide to continue offering the rebate or uh, whatever progress that is. We're also going to be putting information on the billing envelopes. We'll also be sending out emails um, uh, that the, those uh, educational articles will be going out to those who would like them. Um, and we're also uh, going to be at uh, the Wilmington Town uh, Wilmington Farmers Market on Sunday, July 15th, we're going to be doing a ride and drive event in which that will have uh, two parts. One will be a showcase um, of vehicles. Uh, typically, we're going to try and get uh, Reading Territory customers uh, to bring their vehicles to talk about their experiences. We're also going to have dealers there who will either showcase vehicles or take customers out on test drives. Um, watch them again <laughs> so we're hopefully going to get a little bit of interest uh be there and do continue with the education piece um and be there for that that's a great logo by the i mean that little car with the plugged in that was that's real choice that is very <laughs> nice i mean it says it all right there yeah. i mean that is that's excellent I don't know. If I see another picture of it, I probably recognize it. Yeah. I really like that, though. It's very descriptive. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Design, so that means that it adjusts to any screen size and it should look uh, look good from any screen size. So um, I'm just going to show you a couple. Joyce, I don't know if you're probably not being heard for the people that are listening. Right, can we get the mic close to you if you want to sit the, there? I, I don't want to make you move all around, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We just want everybody to hear you, Joyce. Okay. So, good? Okay. All right, so I'm just going to show, uh, show you a few of the key uh, areas. So along the top, we have uh, report and outage. Um, when we get our outage map up and running, that will be up at the top as well. Uh, we have contact us and the search bar, which is a really nice tool to have. Um, this is the main um, menu bar. Uh, we used what's called a mega menu, so that's why it's so wide. Um, so it, you know, it only has a few options when you just look at the bar, but when you expand, there's a couple of categories under each. Um, so there's about RMLD, 
Um, this has all the About Us community, other resources. Um, you'll see over here the Board of Commissioners information can be found right here. So we'll just click on that so you can see it. Our favorite subject. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, for my residents is um, all the all the topics uh, for our residential customers. So billing and payments, service, save energy and money. Hey, sorry about this. Um, for my business, mirrors for my residents, but each menu is targeted towards that specific group of customers. So um, hopefully they find everything they want right there. I'm going to go back to our home page. Uh, we have our Twitter feed here. So anything we put on Twitter will show up right here. Um, underneath that we have the quick links, which um, essentially we looked at our analytics from our old website and we selected um, the most visited items with the exception of a few we tried to put um, all the things that people would typically <coughs> do for most in the quick links so that's what all these items are so of course pay my bill report an outage is here again in case it's missed at the top um, things like rates contact us start stop service um, all those key items are here so in theory um, customers will easily find what they're looking for uh, right away. And then underneath that, there's the um, news and announcements section, which is where we can kind of highlight current events and think, you know, campaigns we're trying to promote and whatnot. So we have, um, you know, a couple things about our electric vehicle programs right now, Shred the Peak, Solar Choice, and we can change this as we go uh, to whatever we'd like to um, highlight at the time. So. And that's basically it. We didn't want to make it too long. We didn't want people to have to scroll down. We figured they would lose interest after a certain amount of time anyway. So um, <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's the home page. Um, any questions about it or anything else you'd like to see? So it's, so it's, it's, up, it's, a, it's fun functioning now, right? Yep. So I just went on my, my mobile and I don't get that, but uh, I get a place to click on for the website, but I don't get that, so. You don't get it? Yes. Huh? So there's a calendar. So when you go into border um, commissioners, you have your calendar, but then when you go to the main calendar, everything's listed. So the cab and everything. So if you can Correct. show so them how you got to the main calendar. Sure. So uh, you can get there a couple ways. Um, under about RMLD, the events calendar is here, and it's also one of the quick links. Um, so basically, when Tracy posts a meeting onto your calendar, it automatically goes onto the events calendar here. Yep. So you can find it on both of those. Yeah, it's it's on the it's what well, about you just don't get that the graphic yeah, right. the picture, but yeah, you get all the, the picture, con all the content yeah. is goes right. this yeah. way instead of this right. way. Correct. Right. Yeah, the picture is too big to work with the phone, right. but everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Looks nice. Oh, it's good. It's great. 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 Very good. Um, otherwise, as far as community relations, mainly we're working on, um, I'm working on promoting. Hey, everybody, excuse me. Would it be okay if I dropped out, or is there another, is there another item coming out? Nope. No, I think it's okay. Doing financials and, uh, that's it. No bids. Okay. In bids. No bids. Oh, no bids. Bye, Dave. Okay. All right, guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Dave. Bye. Thanks for checking in. Joyce, is there, I, I just went through it quickly, is there uh, going to be a separate uh, place for the uh, electric vehicles? Seems like there is for solar, but not. maybe it's because it's so new. But Yeah, there's a, right now we just have the information here in our news and announcements. Yeah. Um, it's certainly something that we could add um, elsewhere as well, maybe under one of the main menu items here. Um, so we we have a lot of flexibility with what yeah. we can do with it. Yeah, I'm just thinking it yeah. seems obviously a lot of buzz and interest on it, so mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be still a work in progress, but it might be a, yeah. a nice way to. Okay, yeah, I'll just show you what we have for content on the, we, we built a whole section on the electric vehicles, so you'll see there's several pages over here. Yeah. Um, the landing page is the rebate programs, um, but there's an electric vehicle 101, which goes over a lot of the content that Ben talked about. Yep. Um, the article series is here. Um, again, why drive electric? Um, 
and this is one of the articles that we uh, recently posted. So there's, we're kind of, we've kind of been building up the content, so <coughs> maybe we'll feature it a little bit more prominently too. Yeah, that's nice. No, it's nice. It's nice to have yeah, a great work. Great work. Yeah, yeah. Right. Good. Thanks, Joyce. Okay, and it looks like um, Wendy. Financials. Oh, good evening. Okay, so tonight we're reporting on um, 10 months of the fiscal year 18, ending April 30th. So the first slide, um, this is showing the relation of our cash to our monthly operating expenses. And so we recently had some uh, FERC training. Someone came in from FERC and, and did a uh, training for a bunch of the staff. And one of the particular statements he made was that the industry standard is to have three to four months of operating cash uh, available. So unrestricted funds available and readily accessible. That is uh, what he said was industry standard. So I know that we have taken the approach that uh, we're, we're targeting about two months and with the understanding that we have some reserve available if we need to dip into it. So I just wanted to show you here what it looks like for the past 10 months and we're, uh, I'm gonna say we're averaging about two to two and a quarter um, times per the monthly expenses mm. for cash, okay? So then uh, we haven't talked about plant a lot so I decided why not tonight? So I just wanted to show you a little pie chart of what is made up of the plant. So um, our total net capital assets as of April is $77.5 million. And of the $77.5 million, you can see that uh, $52.5 million is the bulk of it, which is our, uh, basically our electric infrastructure. So that's your, uh, your poles, anything overhead, anything underground, your transformers, your meters, your street lights. So that makes up the bulk of our net plant. Um, and then you have your uh, structures and improvements at $10.8 million. And your structures and improvements are basically your distributed generator, your substation, and your building upgrades. Then you have your equipment and furnishings of $12.9 million. And that is made up ma um, mainly of your hardware, um, your computer hardware infrastructure and your software, your office furniture, your fleet of vehicles, um, some tools, your GIS and SCADA, and uh, fiber. And then, of course, you have your land uh, that, that the building sits on and your substation sit on at about $1.3 million. So to go further and expand on that, I did a comparison for you to look at uh, the last five years of where plant was and where, where it's going since uh, we're continuing to tell you that we're upgrading our system. Uh, I just want to show you where it's where the money's going. So currently, land um, has been stable. Uh, as you know, uh, we're looking to build a new substation. And then you have your structures and improvements. So it started in 2014 at $6.4 million. And um, a lot of improvements have gone into the substations themselves. And it's gone up to $10.8 million. Okay, and then you look at your equipments and furnishings and you look at that and you say, wow, it looks like it did a little bit of a dip. So $13 million it started at and it's come down to about 12.9. So it's pretty much uh, gone a little bit down or stayed flat. And the reason for that is because uh, we haven't put a lot of money into office equipment or um, furnishings. Even our fleet has not been upgraded very <clears throat> quickly and basically it's been depreciating as quickly as it's being upgraded, okay? And then you look at your infrastructure, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned, your entire, you know, overhead underground electrical infrastructure started at $49.5 million and it has increased to $52.5 million. So you can see where all the capital funds are going uh, in the different, the different areas. And these are not inflation adjusted. They'd be even more dramatic oh. if they were inflation adjusted. I, I would, I, I actually don't understand what that means. 
Mm -hmm. It means uh, if you uh, if you take the uh, any one of these numbers in the past, yes, and uh, as you're moving into the future, you you increase it by whatever the inflation rate is, because a dollar today is not the same as a dollar five years ago. Yeah. But isn't this no. the current this value? Is the, right. So this is the cost of the cost here. of the plant, and as it's being depreciated. Oh, oh I understand. Right. Yeah. But I'm just saying, if we, whenever you're showing yeah. charts over time like this, many people will inflation adjust them. Inflation's been so low <clears throat> that it almost makes no difference. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. But, <coughs> but the point is, it would, it would be even more dramatic. I understand if what you were said. Oh, I see what you said. Okay. So right. It, again, a dollar today. But if I gave you a dollar five, it's not equivalent. If I give you a dollar today or a dollar five years into the future, mm -hmm. which is worth more. Dollar today, today, obviously, right? Because right. I could today. invest it, right? Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I understand. Sure. Okay. So then, um, and the last slide just shows our uh, year-to-date operating and maintenance expenses. So, looks like in April we are straight on with the budget. Pretty much, we've spent exactly what the budget says. We should have about 16.7% um, left in the budget, and that is what we have overall. The total costs. Um, and like I mentioned, we're probably going to go over budget, so we do still have some of those costs that um, some of the uh, bills from the storms, timing, you know, not getting anything in timely and, and whatnot. So you may still see, I, I did a preliminary for May, I think I showed you, Hamid, and it looks like we, we did end up going over in May. I, I didn't have the finals, so, um, but it, it's not looking as drastic as, as I anticipated, so I'm hopeful that it won't. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Very good. Questions? Yeah. Just, just a one quick question on the operating cash relative to the operating expenses. Yes. And I, I see where I'm just sort of curious how the, um, uh, FERC, I know you're saying, recommends three or more yes. times. And that's a very con that's a good conservative approach, right? right? Um, if you looked at uh, other munis, uh, would they be more like us, or would they? Uh, would that include? I mean, what, what do the ISOs look like, for example? I mean, are they uh, similar to that? Do they retain three or four times? I mean, I, I don't. I actually have don't any have idea. that information. But uh, do you have any anything about the ISO? No, we can definitely look. Yeah, into I, I, you know, I don't. I don't want it to be a big deal. I'm just very curious about uh, where we lie on the on the bell right. curve. Probably less relevant is the IOU, more of the munis, right? Yeah, more yeah. the munis certainly yeah. to compare to. Absolutely. Okay, well, we'll look into that, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so uh, I think it's more than just curiosity, too, because, uh, you know, as we've said, the future is somewhat uncertain, right? And uh, we've always historically right. felt right. very comfortable with a couple of months of cash. So uh, I don't know if they provided any more insight. So other than it's nice to have more than less, did FERC give any rationale as to the advantage and there's some obvious advantages right, you can right. Weather but why three months why instead yeah, of two I mean, or, is, yeah. is there something that's yeah. changing in the, the business co economy or climate that's yeah, uh, that's can a good I make question a yes uh, we can get some more information on that typically it stems from not only it can look at loss of customers it can look at major catastrophes of equipment mm -hmm. we've talked in the past about the loss of a substation and yeah. mobile units could cost up to about 20 grand a week yeah. uh, for over a year. I mean, there are there are emergency contingencies, and, and so each utility does it a little bit differently. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, it's between you know two and three uh, months worth of operating cash, but only based on if they say, okay, it's approximately 10 million dollars as a contingency fund to lose a main substation. You know what I mean? So they may earmark it differently. But let's, Wendy and I will work on getting some data out. We can send out a survey to the general managers yeah. of the other utilities. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's timely and it's sort of. I agree. A lot yeah. of it sort of mirrors the discussion we had a couple of months yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure it does. We yeah. answered some of the reasons ourselves. But. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Hamid. Oh, wow. <laughs> You're not looking for any money. You I took the geez. words right out of our mouth. That's right. Your <laughs> colleagues are sitting right there. <laughs> Not looking for any money. Are you? Well, I'm going to give you guys a break. We don't have any bids <laughs> oh. for the All first right. time. Oh. <coughs> okay. so not spend any money, huh? No, stop spending yeah. money. All right. So uh, I'm here to present you the oper uh, engineering operations budget uh, actually spend expenditures for the month of April. So on the first slide, 
second and third. This is as fast as I can go. So. Yale <laughs> 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 was another job for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see the expenditures actually the year, actual year to date spendings uh, for the entire departments, um, engineering operations, facilities, IRDs, and IT, the capital improvement projects. <coughs> that, that brings up the year date to total to five million seven thousand eight hundred ninety-six dollars. And we budgeted seven million six hundred eighty-five thousand five hundred twenty-one dollars. So we are uh, spending the remaining basically in the month of May and June. So we are on target. We'll be spending that money. So the next slide is. Uh, Can I uh, <coughs> yep. I want to make a comment on all the projects that were that they were gracious enough to approve or being have uh, been completed. Correct. Yes. Uh, well, I was going to. Save that for last. You just stole it. Okay. Yeah, you. Fourth of July coming. You wanted to. Yeah, that's right. That's my birthday. Grandfather. Yeah, Fourth of July. I'm a Fourth of July boy. He gave me twenty dollars. I got eighteen left, but I'm spending the other two. I want to know what I'm getting for my money. I want to know what I'm going to get for my birthday coming up. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> all right the routine maintenance basically the transformer replacement program the pole inspections quarterly inspection of the feeders manhole inspections and porcelain cutout replacements they're all on target schedule moving along we inspected uh 10 uh, uh, feeders uh in for this quarter and uh, we haven't found any problems under the routine maintenance continued, the tree trimming is going very well, and probably we, we are getting to almost to the end of the budget, so we're monitoring that very closely, making sure you know, it's not going over the budget. <coughs> but so far, year to date, uh, up to, up to uh, end of the April, uh, we have uh, cut almost 843 spans of the trees the substation maintenance we have infrared uh, scanned uh, all, all the substations and as well as the parks we haven't found any problems yet so it's going good that that pr that it pays for itself itself <coughs> the underground subdivision upgrades uh, three underground uh, subdivisions they were completed up to uh, the, the end of the april and there are eight more that you see there in progress at in various locations in our town. These are the subdivisions that we, uh, they're, uh, and they've got antiquated equipment, the transformers, you know, the cables. We have to basically redo everything from A to Z, from ri the riser pole out on the street all the way to the end of development. We have to, you know, take everything apart because as soon as you touch one, the next one is the next one to go. So we just right then going back and forth, we just, take them all and we take care of them in one shot. <coughs> so that's a routine concert. The next slide is very familiar. I know that everybody is, um, but probably they know it by heart. The ownership of the poles are 50-50 between RMLD and Verizon. The custodial in Reading, we split with Verizon. North Reading is RMLD. The other two communities, Linfield and Wilmington is with Verizon. Uh, this, the is next favorite, this is your favorite slide. That's my favorite right. slide. Yeah, that shows how much work I'm doing. Right. <laughs> so the Linfield, uh, we got uh, 20 transfers and one uh, pole bot that, you know, we got to remove. In North Reading, we got 10 transfers and 49 poles. Uh, Reading, we got 27 transfers, 51 pole. And uh, Wilmington, we got 35 transfers and four poles. So we are, we got lots of projects, especially in the month of May and June. You're going to see these numbers going really high because we've done substantial, we have completed substantial overhead and underground uh, upgrades and, you know, the infrastructures that you see those, those bars that keep going right. up for uh, maintenance and for the... Uh, plant uh, increase. The next slide uh, showing you the RMLD reliability indices. Basically, across the all uh, categories, we're doing very well, uh, well below the national and the regional averages <coughs> for SADI, KD, and SAFI. Uh, so we're doing well. Uh, the next slide is showing you the causes of the outages. As you could see, the five compared to the five years averages. 
We are doing very well. We are basically That's going in the right direction. That's very, very dramatic. Mm. <coughs> right, which, which is good. And the last, uh, I just wanted to I would let you know that the, all the projects basically for FY18, <laughs> <laughs> they're done, completed, uh, and we are now making transitions to FY19. Actually, we are ahead of We already started, all of them. Oh, with the exception of one, the parking lot uh, rearrangements, which, you know, that one. This one. Yeah, this one, right okay. over here, 230 Ashley Street. They're all done. That's great. All done on board. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Thank good you. Work. Great. Had work. a schedule. So, wow. we are now getting. Uh, if I've started the FI 19, the constructions ahead of the st schedule. So hopefully we can get them done. It's great news. Time. Thank you. All right, Hamid. That concludes my quick report. No bids. No. So. That's good. Any questions? <coughs> no. I, I just. Uh, oh. I don't know if there's a plan. So. It, you remember the last meeting we took a tour of the, uh, whatever that's called. Control Operation. Center. Control, Control Center. Center. Yeah. So I don't know if the, the plan is to have others uh, <coughs> who, who would benefit from that. That's a terrific uh, visual of what you're doing. Vanessa, have you ever sure. taken a tour of the control room uh, here? I have not. Oh, oh. we just <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting tonight, but, yeah. you know, if no, you. No, but that's sort of what I had, you know, I think sure. some people, because uh, that shows you what's behind all these right. expenses and, you know, uh, it's very right. impressive. I mean, it just, <coughs> it's, it's really a state of the art. Actually, we, we're installing two more modules that they come up, more technology, which is one is customer portal, uh, which basically all the customers, they could go on the web and they can look at the outage area when there is an outage or when there's a problem. They could see the, the, whether they are included or they're not, or so that's a good map to refer to during the outages. <coughs> And the second one is the dashboard. The dashboard is for administrative uh, uh, purposes. So all the managers, all the employees, they could see, you know, you could see Sadie, Katie, and uh, Safi uh, basically up to date because everything now automatically is being fed into that uh, system. So right now we're calculating some of these and, you know, some processes are being done manually. <clears throat> now, as more automation is being added, so the AMI uh, meters, they report to OMS. OMS is reporting to the dashboard module, and automatically all of these in indices are calculated. So no hands basically involved. Everything automatically is done. Okay, so maybe maybe the uh, takeaway is to Vanessa yeah. specifically, right. but also Neil. I, <coughs> I know George was at our last meeting. He had the benefit of seeing it, but... Can I add something to that? Mm. So, um, so there wasn't a GIS here, a, ge a geographic information system for collecting all of <coughs> the plant assets. So once we collected all of that, so everything <coughs> has the latitude and longitude, and then we drew in all the lines representing the wires so that then Hamid put an engineering modeling system on top of it. So now you can actually see the flow of electricity <coughs> so we can do all of our calculations to make sure that all of our substations are properly loaded and at the end of the lines have the proper voltage. We weren't able to do that in the past. We were able to interconnect all of our communications using the existing fiber loop that goes through all the towns that goes to each of the substation now and comes back to this new control room. So where we used to just answer phones and basically dispatch trucks, Hamid's been working really hard on his technology roadmap of bringing in a smart grid system, which it combines smart meters with some smart switches that are out there that will sense outages open, they'll restore automatically so that the truck rolls are less and we, and we save a lot more money and efficiency that way. Uh, we're also trying to go towards um, eliminating Twitter and having the IVR system yeah. and the outage management <coughs> system detect the outages and send information, text or emails, or on the website you can call up the map to see where the outages are and what the estimated time of restoration. So. It's really, um, I, I want to say that it's, it's, it's appropriate for this size utility, being one of the largest in the state, um, and it brings us into the 21st century. <coughs> Meade was very careful to make sure that everything that we purchased was uh, properly specced and that everything was multi-speak so that it, it, it's non-proprietary so that we can integrate things. So he's did a really fantastic job, and it's come out really, 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 really good. So when that, just a little, so that when you're seeing it, you understand how we pieced it together. We got a little ways to go, right? Um, but uh, it's all coming together. Yeah. But I think job. also for the uh, for the town, 
it becomes a bullet point for having a state-of-the-art electric infrastructure and system uh, for uh, trying to attract business to town, yep. uh, commercial right. or otherwise. Right. Yep. That's the connection. Right. Yeah. We'll be able to dispatch our generators from there uh, right. for peaking and, and be able to monitor the ISOs peaks and our peaks so that, you know, Jane, Jane will have <coughs> access to it. So it, it'll be functional and be brought to <coughs> different dashboards in each of the manager's stations so that they can all use the data that's coming in. So it's, uh, it's coming along quite well. He's right on target, too, with his longer-term yeah. Roadmap. So yeah. good job. Another applause for me. Thank you. Yeah. 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 For the whole team. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Oh. So our board meetings. Uh, we're just going to review this. Yeah, we're good with the lights. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. My pleasure. So we have one Thursday, July nineteenth. I think we're starting a little bit early that day. No, that's the, the regular that's meeting starts at 7.30. 6.30, right. I think. There is a meeting. There's a meeting before that, yeah. And then um, August, we'll, we just have NEPA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody's going, right? You're going, John? Yes. Phil, yep. I'm yep. Going, you're going, Tom? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then uh, Jane. I owe you information. Mm -hmm. You want to go? I think it's open. You can have numbers. So. Oh. You're going, of course, right? Good to NEPA. Yes. And yes, Jane. Please, thank you. Yep. All right. And then uh, September 21st we have as a meeting as well. Cab, you have one coming up, Tom, July 18th. I do. That's what it says here. Oh, okay, then yeah, I'll be there. And then Dave Talbot. Isn't it Phil's turn? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. And then Dave Talbot has September 19th. Okay. okay. Well, I think, is there any other... Yeah, discussion I items. Have, I just have one item okay. for the next uh, meeting. We have, we ought to have we ought to have a discussion on the. Uh, I know we talked to the town about doing some sort of study. I suggest maybe on the next. I ran into uh, the chair of the uh, select board, and he asked where that was. And I think maybe the next meeting we should have an agenda item is to discuss that. As sure. To what the status of we, that is. Why don't we get that on the agenda, Could Tracy? Please. Okay. Yeah. And anything else? By anybody? Okay. Why don't we uh, make a motion that we okay. adjourn you here? You ready? Yeah. We got to go to executive session. Great. Move yep. that the uh, board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real estate and to discuss confidential, competitively sensitive, and proprietary information in relation to making, selling, or distributing electric power and energy and to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Okay. Second. Second. All right. Discussion. Pull All those in favor? Pull the board. Pull, pull. Pull the rock. Aye. David Hennessy, aye. Mr. Pacino, aye. Mr. Stempeck, aye. All right. And Dave's not here. Motion carries four to zero. Right. All right. Very good. Neil, thank you for attending. Yep. Yes. It's my pleasure. We need the light man. <laughs> Neil, you want to join us for a quick tour? Uh, I would love to. However. Do we have executive session? We have executive session. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Vanessa, how's it going? Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> nice to see you. Hey, Thanks nice for coming. See you again.